Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Uh, this is Ignacio Deirit with the Center for Creative Land Recycling, uh, joined by Johanna uh, Roth, and welcome to the Writers of the Best ARC. Uh, this will be a webinar to talk about uh, uh, strategies to improve your ARC grant application. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, you may download the presentation by clicking on the console to the right of your screen. Uh, there's a handouts uh, panel there. Uh, please type any questions in the chat box. Uh, we will answer most questions at the end. We might take one or two after each uh, presentation, but generally we'll try to reserve all the presentations at the end, uh, the questions at the end. We appreciate your feedback, so please respond to the webinar that follows this uh, the survey that follow this, follows this webinar. Uh, just a little bit about the Center for Creative Land Recycling. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We, we conduct workshops and webinars. We are uh, an EPA technical assistance to Brownfields grantee uh, serving regions two, nine, and 10. We also conduct policy research and consulting. And please visit us at uh, www.cclr.org and a link to us on social media because we do have a lot of information uh, everywhere. Uh, we do have uh, keep up to speed on our webinars, our events, our articles. And uh, we will, be before we begin, we'll conduct a few polling questions to find out what our audience composition looks like. So please. Uh, respond to the following uh, polling questions. First is, what is it, what sector do you work in? Okay. All right. Uh, we most of you have responded and. Uh, half of you are uh, with the government, uh, about a third with the private sector, and we have nonprofits, and we have 3% other. The next polling question is, what is your background? Great, thank you. So, 20% uh, are uh, are developers. 57% uh, are supporters, I guess, of brownfields, and uh, about a quarter of you are just interested in brownfields. Next question. All right, uh, where you live, a lot of you live in urban areas, uh, uh, a bit more than half. Many are in a rural town, about 20%, and a quarter in rural area. The next question is Stab region. Which Stab region uh, are you in? Uh, so two, nine, and 10 are C clear. Uh, one, Three and four are NJIT, and the rest are in KSU, Kansas State. Great, almost, wow, an even split. Wow, we've never seen that before. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's proceed now uh, to, we have a great uh, lineup of speakers for you. Uh, so our first, uh, speaker Camille Swayze is uh, with the Sierra Institute, and uh, you know I'm not going to go through all the bios, but Camille probably has the distinction of being the youngest grant recipient, uh, at least that CCLIR is aware of, which points to the possibility that uh, practically anyone can write a good grant. Not that Camille is just anyone, but she really put a lot of, lot, lot of effort into it, and she worked closely with CCLIR. Uh, Eileen Christensen is with Beck Environmental, and she will talk about uh, Nye County and the coalition grant they have there. 
Uh, our next speakers after them are Matt Reamer with the City of Milwaukee. Milwaukee has a very long-standing uh, program, a very successful one. Uh, they've had their ups and downs, mostly ups, and Matt can will share those uh, successes and challenges with you. Uh, and last, our last speaker is Chris Jadak with Stantec, and uh, Cicli has worked with Stantec closely over the last half dozen years in many rural communities. Uh, most of them are um, coalition grantees in rural and some urban areas. So uh, the mix we have here covers pre pretty much the demographic of, of the rest of the country. So with much, not much ado, I will uh, give some background first on the history of Brownfields grants and then proceed to our speakers. Just for a little background, um, so here's the uh, recent history of Brownfields Grant Awards. Uh, the years with the asterisks are when the revolving loan fund were not fund or not offered. Uh, so the uh, even years are when the RLF were offered. And if you look two years back, uh, it's pretty consistent with what we had this year as far as the number of grantees and the numbers that applied. Uh, the second number in FY18 and FY17, uh, the first number, 144, are the number of communities that received awards, and 221 is the number of grants actually awarded, because many communities received more than one grant. Uh, the batting average uh, is roughly about 35 36%, and so that gives you an idea of how competitive it is. Uh, looking at the dollars awarded, uh, the last four years have been pretty consistent, and that's really subject to the appropriations that uh, the EPA receives every year. Uh, so for the next coming year, uh, it will be affected now by the new the Build Act of 2018. Uh, funding remains the same, but again. Uh, uh, Congress may decide to appropriate more next year. We have uh, we have to stand by and see what that looks like. Uh, changes include uh, changes to the cleanup grants, which are now uh, up to five hundred thousand per site, uh, and a possible way uh, six hundred fifty thousand with a waiver. There is now a multi-purpose grant, which was awarded once, uh, so we have a little experience with that. Uh, there are administrative costs are now uh, allowed up to 5% of the grant, uh, and nonprofit eligibility will change. So look, uh, look out for that for the next uh, cycle. Uh, the, guide, the guidelines will probably be out in the fall, early fall, so uh, it will be different from the past years. So it may affect the way you um, prepare for your grants. And there was a, a webinar uh, a month ago uh, hosted by our partner, Kansas State. Uh, the webinar recording and slides are available on that link. So follow that link and you can view the entire webinar next. So our first speaker now is Camille. And I'm going to ask her now to uh, start her presentation. Thanks, Ignacio. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Camille Swayze. I'm a program lead at the Sierra Institute for Community and Environment. We're a nonprofit in rural Northeastern California. Uh, we're new to Brownfields, at least in the last few years we are. Um, so I'll be giving you an overview of our experience, starting off with some context to where we work, who we are, some of the challenges that this area faces and then go into the brownfield cleanup process and grant writing experience. Next slide, please. Plumas County lies uh, at the intersection of the Sierra Nevada mountain range and the Cascade mountain range. Uh, it's a really beautiful area. It's really rural, um, pretty sparsely populated. There's 20,000 people in the whole county. It's very heavily forested, and unfortunately, there's a pretty high risk of fire throughout the county as well. And communities here are generally pretty impoverished. Next slide. The 
Issues that are driving the work I'm going to share with you in more detail soon um, is that for one, our forests here in the Sierra have been mismanaged for centuries and we're now facing the consequences of that. Uh, low severity fires were historically very regular and a normal part of the forest ecosystem, but now we have these unnaturally dense forests following um, centuries of fire suppression and uh, even aged management of forests. So um, we're now seeing catastrophic wildfires as a new normal. Uh, also seeing more tree mortality from the drought and bark beetles. And all of this puts our carbon stores at risk. It puts wildlife habitat at risk and also the communities living with within and around the forest are at risk as well. Uh, and fires also damage watersheds. And this is a really important watershed we live in as it feeds the state water project, which supplies LA with its water. So what happens up here matters statewide. This area is also very impoverished following the decline of the timber industry. Over the last 30 years, we just haven't really seen um, jobs come back since then. And we have high unemployment and poverty and lack of jobs. Next slide, please. So uh, the Sierra Institute works to address these challenges through a variety of programs and projects. Uh, Check out our website to learn about all of them. But as a whole, we invest in the well being of rural communities and try to strengthen their participation in natural resource decision making. And the town we're based in, Taylorsville, has uh, got a grand total population of 154 people. And all of our employees are rural residents living and breathing the rural way of life. Next slide, please. We've been working to address the dense forest issues and lack of jobs um, as an organization by working to redevelop this abandoned sawmill site in our valley into a wood products campus for the past seven or eight years now. And the vision for this campus is that, will, is that it will produce value-added products out of low-value waste wood material that comes from fire risk reduction and forest restoration activities. This, uh, this material, which includes small diameter trees and brush and whatnot, has no value and there's nowhere to take it, so the work won't get done in the forest. So by creating a business campus that uses this material, we can also create jobs along the way and revitalize the wood products industry in a more sustainable effort. Next slide. Examples of uh, wood products businesses that can value add low value wood include wood chips for biomass heating systems or for greenhouses or for bioenergy, firewood, posts and poles, um, cross laminated timber, an emerging building product in California right now. And we've identified business operators and we uh, have worked through financing and business planning for a long time now. Next slide. The site is 28 acres. It was formerly home to a LP sawmill that closed in the 80s. And the site's been vacant ever since that mill closed down. So we've got some arsenic in the soil throughout the site, uh, primarily from spreading incinerator ash that was used for dust suppression. There was also thought that uh, the mine tailings that were used to develop the site 100 years ago also contributed to a lot of the arsenic. The site lies next to Indian Creek which feeds the Feather River, as I said, a very important river for California. The community sees this site as a sore ice site. And given its heavy industry zoning, redevelopment of this into a wood products business campus is kind of an ideal way to go about it. Next slide. So in a really general sense, this is what this campus will help be achieved, will help reduce the risk of fire in this area improve forest health, therefore increase carbon sequestration and job creation. And in general, the cleanup and redevelopment of this campus really allows us to achieve the triple bottom line outcomes for the community. So that's benefiting the environment, the economy, and the community all at once. Next slide. In 2014, we recognized the need for the site assessment work, given the former operations and the liability issues of site purchase. So we've had a number of assessments and reports performed since then, all funded by EPA opportunities and California Department of Toxic Substance Control. In 2016, the Plumas County Community Development Commission applied for an EPA assessment grant to support us. And that work's been underway for about a year now, and we're expecting a cleanup plan to be completed within the next month. And the cherry on top of this whole journey has been 
the successful cleanup grant applications uh, that came through pretty recently. And we're looking forward to getting that work started too. Next slide. Given the nature of our work, we have a lot of partners and support here locally. We're pretty much the main and only nonprofit group with redevelopment and cleanup interests of the site, uh, as we are in a rural area and there aren't a ton of nonprofits, but county government has been incredibly supportive of us since the beginning, um, probably because the site would sit here unused and contaminated if we weren't um, dipping our toes in these issues. And the community as a whole is very supportive as well, as people want to see jobs, they want to see the forest cleaned up, and they want to see the site put back to use. Next slide. So given our redevelopment goals, uh, over time we've leveraged a lot of funds to make this business campus development effort happen um, from a variety of funding sources. Forest Service is very supportive, rural development is. Another entity I forgot to include on here is the Warehouser Family Foundation. So a lot of time and money has been invested into planning for this site outside of the Brownfields work. Um, it's a really involved effort that we have seen the Brownfields process as a barrier, um, as it's expensive and it's slowed us down. Next slide. The biggest challenge for us has been that California Brownfield law is limited and that it does not have protections for rural nonprofit groups working to do what we're doing. And the reality is that there are so many abandoned sawmill sites and these sites are critical for rural economic development. But the main groups in these rural areas that are trying to redevelop these sites are nonprofits um, and community groups that need to be able to, de to just demonstrate financial assurance as the state requires to get the liability protections. But because we're a nonprofit, we can't do it. And we're also in an unincorporated area and our county um, is not comfortable with taking on that uh, cleanup oversight role. Next slide. So a big emphasis for our cleanup grant application was just really making the case for the importance of this project. Uh, we really tried to tell the whole story, starting with the issues driving our work, um, the unhealthy dense forests, the fires, the impoverished community. Uh, then we also went into our planned redevelopment, talked about the challenges of being a nonprofit leading this work. Uh, and I'd say in terms of narrative writing, that's probably the most important part of having a compelling application uh, and really making the case, why does your project need funding? What's compelling about the project? Why is it unique? And tying all those pieces together so they align with the message of your application and also um, align with current policy happenings. There's a lot of momentum in California right now for healthy forests and forest management and wood utilization. So uh, that's helped us. And we use a lot of statistics to further make the case for the issues in this area. Next slide. I also really recommend identifying really specific and strong outcomes of your work. So for us, for example, clean of the cleanup of the site will allow us to redevelop it, therefore creating X many jobs and lead to this many acres of forest land treated uh, and really demonstrating how this redevelopment will make the environment and local community better. We also demonstrated that we're ready to move forward. We've got our funding in place for planning. We've been doing financing work and it's really just the cleanup process that's holding us up. Um, we've got a timeline in place. We have the par partnerships ready. So that readiness is really attractive to funders um, with any grant application really. We write a lot of grants here at Sierra Institute, but I have to say this has probably been the most involved and complicated proposals I've worked on. I personally even have a hard time starting a grant proposal early, but this one you have to start early, specifically because cleanup grants require a public meeting to be held like a month in advance. I mean, I don't know if that's the same every year, but this last year that was the case, so it required us to start early which was good because it was pretty complicated. Uh, we've leaned heavily on EPA for their support and guiding us through this process as we're new to the Brownfields world. Um, and that's been really, really helpful for us. And C. Claire has been really supportive of us too. So I suggest you all do the same.
Next slide. Well, uh, yeah, so that's it. Give me a call if you have more questions. I had a contact slide on there, but it maybe disappeared. Um, yes. Uh, yes, the contact information for all the speakers will be at the end of the presentation. And I think a couple of compelling questions came up, so we're going to um, uh, interject right now. Uh, uh, one thing uh, for all the uh, for all the listeners that uh, the Build Act uh, authorizes the amount that at least for Sierra uh, uh, this grant uh, the six hundred thousand would have been covered by one cleanup grant. Uh, again, the limits will change, uh, so please take note of that uh, when you're preparing for your grant. And a question for Camille: um, Did you use air quality benefits? Uh, in your analysis, uh, and uh, and if you didn't, uh, any reason why you couldn't? Yeah, that's a really good question. We we always use the air quality benefit when we're making the case for wood utilization. Uh, catastrophic fires have a really intense and detrimental air quality emissions profile. And by improving forest health to reduce the chance of these catastrophic fires, we're, we really see a lot of benefit in that. Um, and so that was, definitely, that was definitely part of the proposal. Thank you. And another question was, what does ACS stand for? ACS stands for American Community Survey, which is, uh, you can get, uh, access that uh, through the census. So our next speaker is Eileen Christensen with BEC Environmental, and they have been working with Nye County and uh, four, I mean six other counties uh, around the region, uh, and they provide a unique uh, viewpoint and experience in coalition grants with very small communities and tribes. So Eileen, take it away. Well, thank you, Ignacio. Hi, I'm Eileen Christensen, and um, it's got back environmental here on the bottom of a lot of the slides, but I wanted to clarify that the success associated with the, the grants that I'm about to describe to you is uh, mainly the, as a result of the vision and the involvement of Nye County's leadership and staff. Um, the champion of the Nye County Brownfields program um, at the time was a commissioner with uh, their board of commissioners, Joni Eastley, and a couple of the other commissioners there that have also uh, been supportive of the program from the beginning. In fact, initially they were kind of not really sure they wanted to pursue this back in 2002 when they went after their first pilot demonstration project. But they ended up being extremely successful. They got their first grant in 2002 that included a green space, $50,000 um, stipend that was awarded to help support um, a project in the Beatty Habitat Trails area, and that resulted in an award by Fish and Wildlife Service to the town of Beatty for the efforts that they um, did to help preserve the habitat for the Amargosa toad and, and just do a, a tremendous amount of work together to build the trail system there. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. I mentioned that Nye County was the very first um, entity that applied for a brownfield grant in this area. Um, but with their success, one of the great things about working in, in rural communities, and in, in fact, with this area, we're talking more frontier communities, because this, the entire area for the six county and one tribal coalition is 55,300 square miles. And the total population in that area is 83,442 people. Of that, about 35,000 of them are located in, in Pahrump, Nevada, down close to uh, Las Vegas. So, most of these areas have fewer than, um, well, half a person per square mile. So Nye County started off in 2002, but since then they've gotten um, three assessment grants, including that first one, three coalition grants, because as they showed success, their neighbors, who they communicate with on a regular basis anyway on other projects, um, were interested in joining. And since Nye County led the way, they were interested in, in, in managing um, and helping manage the grant for all of their community members because they'd gained that experience through the process. Because like Camille said, it is not an easy process to go through and it does take a lot of help 
um, EPA has been tremendously supportive and, um, and having contracts through people like CCLIR, Ignacio has been wonderful to work with. So there, it really is a grant program that focuses on interrelationships, intercommunication, and coalition building well beyond what your grant says. Um, on, to, on to the next slide here, please. Okay, so the stakeholders we doc, talked about, the counties involved include Nye, Esmeralda, Lincoln, Mineral, and White Pine. They're all located in Nevada. But Inyo County does a lot of work with Nye County, and, and in particular, they were interested in renewable energy. So Inyo County also joined this coalition for um, pursuit of a specific element of the Brownfields program. And then the Duckwater Tribe are our most recent addition that are interested in the food, food security element. As as each of these um, grant applications has gone forward, like I said, three in assessment, three for coalition. They also got three job training grants because they wanted to focus on employing local people to accomplish some of the cleanup, and, and that's led to several benefits. They've been able to open up new industries in each of these communities to service the, the expanded economic diversification they've seen as a result of participation in these grants. Um, and then they've gotten two revolving loan fund grants, and they've already issued their first two loans um, for cleanup of a couple of different projects. But the, the point is, again, US EPA was extremely supportive, but so is the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection and California State Department of Toxic Substances Control. They both had to sign off on the application, and like Camille said, you need to start early because one of the things you'll need is a, a letter from your, your um, environmental authority within your state just acknowledging that you're participating in this program and, and getting their support for that. Local elected officials, we've had some phenomenal support from each one of those counties and from the tribal um, council for Duckwater. They've not only supported it, but they even helped when, when we ran out of funding, Nye County ran out of funding at one point back in the recession to, uh, they couldn't cover the cost of the grant. So they went to each of their coalition partners and each one of them was willing to help pay for the cost of developing the application because it is not, again, inexpensive, but you can receive significant dividends by participating in the grant and then all of the leverage that you can get from other federal agencies to support the program. Um, and then again, the public, initially the public was not necessarily supportive of the program, but through a lot of intensive outreach, not just by the Nye County Brownfield staff, but they ended up identifying a person within each county, um, county coalition member and the Duckwater tribe to represent the Brownfields program to their communities. So in, in pushing forward with community outreach and showing that people were actively engaged and benefiting from the program in each community, because we made a point of doing assessments in each one of the coalition member communities, we made sure that if any questions were asked, everything was transparent. We've got an rdsbc.org website that shows a lot of the activities and the, the uh, projects that have been successfully completed or that are currently underway. So communication is extremely important. And the public, although initially was not necessarily supportive of the project over the first couple of years, has since then been extremely supportive. So next slide, please. The thing that really brought all of these communities together is the common interest. They're all, um, they're all large counties, and they have a large quantity of, of land within their geopolitical boundary, but much of that land is actually controlled by the federal government, either Bureau of Land Management, um, the Forest Service, uh, Department of Defense. Each one of them had limited economic diversification, a lot of them associated with either the federal jobs from the federal agencies, or mining. That was a lot of mining ex exploration had been um, occurring over the past few years. Um, they're all in a dry, high desert climate with limited water resources, and again, limited access to emergency response and healthcare. I mentioned the town of Pahrump was the largest community. It's located in the very tip of, of uh, southern tip of Nye County, but the rest of the the community and many of the other communities are serviced strictly by volunteers. So in many cases, volunteers are having to travel two hours, three hours to the nearest hospital. When they do have an accident they have to respond to, 
they get a call at their home in many cases. They hop in their car, they go over the emergency ambulance barn, they pick up the ambulance, go off and respond to the call, and then have to haul their that um, patient off to the nearest hospital, which is, again, hours away. We're not talking minutes. So very challenging community um, circumstances. If you can go to the next slide, please. However, all of them also recognize there's got to be other ways that we can diversify our economy. And we've had a series of meetings that, um, again, because of brownfields, we were able to um, work with some of the other federal agencies, and specifically the Department of Energy, to promote um, redevelopment of some of the sites, like the old mine sites. The picture here is of the solar reserve facility, um, Crescent Dunes. Crescent Dunes uses one of the old substations from the Anaconda Mine. So instead of drawing power from the grid to support mine milling operations, the solar reserve facility now uploads uh, electrons on the grid and generates electricity. And this particular project ended up um, resulting in a $900 million private investment in the or near the town of Tonopah in Nye County. And they've pursued many other renewable energy developers because once Nye County developed those relationships, they shared them with all of their coalition partners. Um, community leader participation, again, provided institutional knowledge. And the community leaders have been wonderful at sharing that information. Next slide, please. One of the key things we found to the success, not only in developing the application, but also in completing them in a timely manner, is figure out your projects first. Don't just apply for the funding and try to figure out where it'll fit later. It just takes too long and the community um, tends to lose interest if, you don't, if they don't see success followed fairly immediately after your initial assessments. The last thing you wanna do is assess a bunch of properties that never get rebuilt or redeveloped. And when you do find challenges along the way, try to figure out ways to work with EPA and your other federal agency partners and your community members to fix them. So for example, Minescard Lands, we really didn't know what to do with some of the properties that had been donated, quote unquote, by some of the mines to uh, local communities. So EPA helped fund a technical, through a technical assistance grant, a working group. And DOE was one of those working group members that helped identify solar incident potential. Um, when we ran into foreclosed properties, what we were finding is in rural communities, people buy up property because it's dirt cheap. They figure, well, Here's a tax foreclosure. Well, basically, the, because of non-payment of taxes, some of the properties go back to the communities. But when they do and people buy them and don't realize ahead of time that there is an environmental liability, all that happens is those same properties end up going back on the tax dole um, years later. So we were seeing a constant re, um, revisiting of the same properties closed for taxes over and over again. So we ended up implementing a, or we didn't, Nye County ended up implementing an ordinance to allow phase ones to be done prior to um, auction of those tax foreclosed properties. Um, we promoted economic development through Brownfields education and many of the jobs that were created to service the solar industry um, came out as a result of the Brownfields job training grant. And again, the key is ongoing long-term commitment to site redevelopment. Don't assume that just because you've started and you've done the assessment, your work is done. The economic development portion has just begun. Next slide, please. Um, some of the examples of projects that were successfully completed, if you take a look at that top right-hand corner, the Pink Motel was one of the first projects that was assessed through the Brownfields program in Nye County. And um, the community worked diligently to figure out a reuse plan for that area and ended up um, determining that the best reuse for that area because that ho particular hotel is right on Main Street or was right on Main Street, right through the town of Tonopah. They needed a new volunteer center for their fire department and that is what the building is immediately below the next photo. Um, if you'll notice, there's also a recharging stations because Tesla was very impressed with the community drive and, and participation by the community leaders and when Tesla was looking for a place to site some of the recharging facilities, they talked to the community and the community said, we want to highlight this property. We've all worked together to make this redeveloped. And, and so Tesla invested more than $150,000 for those recharging stations. 
So another, um, another example of some leverage funding is the McGill, McGill Bill Ballpark in White Pine County. They were able to leverage almost a million dollars in um, Southern Nevada planning, uh, the Land Management Act through it, that specialized in Nevada for cleaning up um, the ballpark and redeveloping it. That was separate and distinct from the Brownfields funding, but Brownfields got them kickstarted. So next slide, please. The key to making a successful grant application, like Camille said, and like you're gonna hear from Ignacio and the rest of the speakers, is you've got to be complete. You've got to answer um, the questions that are asked in the grant application, even, seem, even if it seems like they're redundant. Um, and you want to try to make your story or make the grant easy to read, because if you were on the review board, you have to think of how it would, how you would be responding if you had to read this. And in fact, that's what we do is we ask multiple reviewers to take a look at each application. And we found that especially if they come from diverse backgrounds, they bring um, good observations to the table and help us refine the grant and make it even better. And, and Ignacio has always reviewed our grants, so we want to really thank him for that. Um, concise descriptions. Again, brevity is, is the soul of wit. You want to keep them concise, but also pointed. You want to make sure that um, you're getting to the point quickly. And again, like Camille said, you want to make your argument or your presentation compelling. Okay, on to the next slide. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, we'll uh, go uh, to our next speaker now. Uh, we'll save uh, questions for later. Our next speaker is Matt with the City of Milwaukee. Matt. I think, Matt, you might be muted. Okay, while we're waiting for Matt, uh, let's maybe do some polling questions. So for the audience, we have a couple more polling questions here. Uh, how many applications have you submitted previously? Oh, we have okay. we have quite a lot of uh, viewers who haven't uh, submitted one, so this is a great one to start with. Uh, next question. So, for those who have written grants before, uh, how soon bef uh, before the grant deadline do you start preparing? Uh, a week before, a month before, after the notice of uh, funding, or it depends on your workload. All right, so a lot of people seem to be dependent on their workload, but uh, as you heard from our first two speakers, you have to start way earlier than that. So make sure your workload is already free. You should start preparing for it now. Uh, let's see, is Matt, can you, uh, are you around? Hello, Ignacio, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to start uh, the presentation again. Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Now we can hear you. Right. We didn't hear you the first. Whatever you said just before now, we didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, I'm glad you're hearing me now. All right. Uh, again, uh, as Ignacio Seven is Matt, uh, I work here in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, and today I'm going to be uh, talking about our city of Milwaukee uh, Brownfields program uh, and offer some tips that we've learned uh, over the years here. Uh, that should contribute uh, to writing a successful uh, EPA uh, grant application. Uh, next slide, please. I'd uh, like to start just by uh, giving you a little bit of background uh, on Milwaukee. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't know, uh, Milwaukee is located uh, here in the Midwest, right along Lake Michigan, uh, about an hour and a half, about 90 miles north uh, of Chicago. Um, you know, being adjacent to Lake Michigan here, as you can see, uh, it really makes Milwaukee uh, a desirable place to, to live, uh, to work, and uh, to do business. Uh, it's a pretty tremendous place to, to be. Uh, next slide, please. 
Milwaukee, uh, as you can see here, we're, we're home to numerous well-known uh, successful companies, including uh, five different uh, Fortune 500 uh, headquarters, such as uh, Northwestern Mutual, uh, we've got Rockwell Automation, uh, Harley Davidson. Uh, we're also home to uh, G Healthcare and, uh, and Johnson Controls uh, as well. Uh, next slide. Manufacturing uh, really has uh, defined our past uh, here in Milwaukee. Uh, you know, we've had so many different types of manufacturing here. We've had you know, tanneries, uh, foundries, uh, many breweries, uh, tool and die makers, uh, and other types of manufacturing uh, that have really contributed uh, to the significant uh, brownfield issues uh, that we continue to see uh, here in Milwaukee today. Uh, next slide. This is uh, just a, a picture here uh, of a uh, industry located uh, along a river here uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this uh, next slide here is a, is a picture of an historical rail yard uh, that was located here in Milwaukee. And you really get, uh, you really get a sense uh, from this picture uh, of the heavy industry uh, that was once located here. Uh, that heavy industry uh, has really resulted in you know contaminated properties that are located you know throughout the city of Milwaukee uh, that we are still dealing with today, whether they be in you know some industrial centers in Milwaukee or uh, you know right in the middle of neighborhoods uh, you know adjacent to to residences. Uh, next slide. Uh, fortunately, uh, the city of Milwaukee, uh, we have access to numerous brownfield financial tools uh, here. Uh, the city of Milwaukee itself, we've got a uh, successful brownfield uh, cleanup revolving loan fund uh, that we utilize on a regular basis. Uh, the state of Wisconsin, uh, through the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, uh, and then the uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, uh, they both have uh, assessment and cleanup grants uh, that we're able to, to utilize. Um, and then the EPA, of course, uh, has its assessment and cleanup programs, which have really been uh, essential to uh, so many redevelopment projects uh, here in Milwaukee. Uh, next slide. Uh, one particular uh, you know, brownfield uh, site that I'd like to just talk about briefly is, is the Menominee Valley. Uh, this site here uh, is about four miles long and a half mile wide. Again, it's located in an area called the Menominee River Valley. Um, it extends, uh, again, about four miles long uh, down to the site uh, of the Miller Park Stadium uh, where the Milwaukee Brewers play. Uh, and again, for thousands of years, this large property, 1,200-acre property, uh, was a wild rice marsh, actually, uh, and home to uh, American Indians that had settled there. Um, and by the mid-1800s, uh, this, uh, this settlement, the settlement of Milwaukee, I should say, pushed toward the valley. Uh, and Milwaukeeans actually filled the marsh that was there with uh, whatever they could find. It was soil, it was gravel, it was it was waste, uh, many times industrial waste, uh, to create land there uh, for additional development opportunities. Um, and so by the early uh, 1900s, Milwaukee it was actually known as the machine shop of the world. They manufactured so many different things down there, farm machinery, uh, rail cars, electric motors, and cranes. Uh, and many other items, all manufactured uh, down in the valley. Uh, and the result uh, of this work by the late you know, 1900s or so, you know, manufacturing practices changed, uh, and the valley, unfortunately, was left you know, just a, a blighted area uh, with abandoned, you know, contaminated land, vacant industrial buildings. Uh, it was not an area uh, you know, that people that people went to any longer. They, it was pretty much uh, an area you did not want to be and you wanted to get through it uh, or over it, uh, you know, as quickly as you could. Um, but fortunately, by again, by the late uh, 1900s, in 1998, uh, the city of Milwaukee developed a uh, land use plan uh, for the Menominee Valley. Uh, and at that time, uh, put together a plan uh, and, and started seeking assessment and cleanup dollars uh, and the redevelopment of the valley uh, started to move forward, uh, and today uh, the valley is a is a, a tremendous place. It's a, it's a national model of, of economic and environmental sustainability. 
Uh, next slide, please. This is just a picture here of, uh, of what the Menominee Valley uh, used to look like. You can see the, the heavy, uh, dense industry that was located there uh, years ago. And then uh, next slide, we've, uh, City of Milwaukee has managed to uh, you know, assess and, uh, and clean up that area uh, and bring a lot of uh, new companies uh, and new jobs uh, uh, down to that down to that area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the successful redevelopment of the of the valley here was was achieved by using uh, such a wide range uh, of financial tools, some of which I've mentioned. You know, there was a creation of a tax incremental financing district for the area. We had a total of, uh, of 19 uh, federal and state grants, uh, a couple different loans, uh, and some tax credits and incentives went into the project uh, as well. Next slide, please. Again, none of this would have, would have been possible uh, without the assistance of, of many different people and organizations. There was numerous nonprofits uh, that helped with the redevelopment of the area, uh, various funders, uh, local companies, uh, stewardship crews, and then uh, a lot of different uh, partners, including you know, strategic and, and public and community partners that really uh, came to the table and offered their thoughts and opinions on, uh, on redevelopment of the valley uh, and, and really contributed to making, it is, uh, making what it is uh, uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the funding sources uh, that was used in the Menominee Valley uh, and numerous other uh, brownfield projects here in Milwaukee has been the EPA funding. Uh, Milwaukee has been extremely fortunate uh, over the years. We've received about $21 million of EPA funding since the late 90s. Uh, you can see we've received about $4 million in assessment funds, about $7 million in cleanup funds, uh, and about uh, over $10 million uh, of revolving loan funds. And those funds alone have, have contributed to about $410 million of redevelopment, you know, over 4,000 jobs, uh, and, and about 270 acres uh, made ready for redevelopment uh, here in the city, much of which uh, ha has been redeveloped. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, Milwaukee, uh, we've been very successful uh, with the EPA grants over the years. Um, you know, as everyone knows, the, the EPA grants have, have just become so competitive, uh, I would say, particularly in recent years. Um, and we've just had to continue to uh, improve our applications uh, to the best we can. Uh, and some of the things I'll mention here, uh, you've heard today uh, from, uh, from Camille uh, and Eileen, um, you know, try to identify projects and start writing as soon as possible. Uh, you know, it seems like uh, we're often uh, working on and fine-tuning uh, our grants pretty close to pretty close to the due date, uh, if not right up to it. So, really, just allowing for plenty of time uh, to complete the application uh, is crucial. And you've heard that today uh, from the other speakers. Um, you know, another thing uh, that we've learned is is really to make a strong connection. Uh, and create a compelling story between the needs and the impacts of brownfields, uh, the proposed work, uh, and the benefits. Uh, I've attended uh, several uh, you know, EPA or uh, grant writing workshops, uh, you know, whether it be in person or uh, via webinars. And you know, one of the phrases I heard one time that made me laugh out loud was, was make them cry. Uh, you know, I, I tend to keep that in mind when I'm writing grants, you know, just hoping that uh, you know the, the the reader is gonna is gonna shed a tear when they're when they're reading my grant application. Uh, one of the things that I've heard uh, recently from our EPA project officer is really to uh, you know if you have a current brownfields program to to highlight those successful projects uh, and explain the need for additional funding uh, to build on previous successes uh, that you've had. Um, you know explaining how your community is different uh, than other applicants. And not not writing like a general uh, a general paragraph that could really could be applicable to to any other application, um, and it's been stressed numerous times to me to how important it is to quantify information. You don't want to just state a fact. You want to be able to back it up with data, 
examples, specific details. Uh, you know, if you don't do that, there's a really good chance you're you're going to lose points uh, uh, throughout the grants or on that particular section. Uh, if possible, uh, definitely having multiple people uh, review the grants. Uh, again, that goes back to allowing plenty of time to, to prepare the grant so you have time uh, to let others read that grant and, and to come back with their comments uh, and then work on you know, reviewing uh, you know, and editing uh, your grant. Something that we haven't always done, but we've done recently, is really making use uh, of the technical assistance provider. We have KSU uh, tab in our region, uh, and they're great people to work with. Uh, they take a lot of time uh, and read through the grants. They're obviously very familiar with the grant, uh, EPA grant guidelines, and, uh, and have had tremendous comments uh, for us uh, on our grants, and it really helps. Um, really helps to get that additional detail uh, into the grant that's going to strengthen uh, the proposal. Uh, you know, every point, as they say, counts, and it, it truly does, uh, as we've heard. Uh, and lastly, I will say, uh, if you've had uh, some, if, you, if you've been unsuccessful uh, in an EPA grant, having that EPA debrief uh, is just so important. Um, it really gives you an opportunity to understand where you lost points, uh, in your grants and how you can improve those future grants. Um, I think we submitted, at least me personally, uh, submitted a couple grants uh, a couple years, you know, two years back. Got the EPA uh, debrief uh, from from the EPA person. Came back last year uh, with those two grants, both improved based on what they said, uh, and we were successful uh, on receiving both of those grants. So. If you're not successful one year and that project is still kicking around and you think you want to try for it again, uh, I strongly suggest doing so because that's what we did here uh, in Milwaukee and, uh, and, it, and it worked. So with that, I will uh, conclude uh, my presentation. Uh, uh, we're going to go to the next speaker. Uh, so uh, Chris with Stantec. Uh, thank you, Ignacio, and, and thank you, Matt. Um, uh, I'm Chris Jadak. I work for uh, Stantec Consulting Services. We're a large full-scale uh, architecture and engineering and planning firm with uh, over 400 locations, actually. So um, that, that gives us the footprint to uh, and an opportunity to work with um, municipalities throughout the country um, on EPA brownfield grant projects, uh, the, the bulk of which are, are funded by um, state and federal grants. And I was just kind of reflecting on how appropriate it is that I'm, I'm following the city of Milwaukee today uh, on my port a portion of the presentation. Um, actually, the uh, core members at uh, Stantex EPA Brownfield Grant Team uh, really owe you know their roots to um, the city of Milwaukee's program. Uh, we a handful of us were uh, environmental consultants uh, under contract to the city of Milwaukee back in the early 2000s, and we saw all the great things that Milwaukee was doing and how robust a program they had and how they were going out and getting uh, maximum funding awards each year. Um, and we really thought to ourselves, hey, um, we can take uh, this great knowledge that um, Milwaukee's provided us to other communities throughout the country. And you know, as a result, uh, a, a decade later, um, we've helped over 70 communities in, in 80 EPA regions um, secure funding. Um, Ignacio asked me today to share uh, our experience in uh, working with coalitions, um, as well as working with small towns and rural areas. Um, the red dots on the map uh, on this slide um, indicate all the places where we have active coalitions that uh, are working together uh, to implement uh, you know, a series of EPA brownfield grants, uh, the core of which is uh, uh, community-wide assessment grants. Um, the orange dots on the map represent um, rural communities uh, that actually, you know, have gone after these grants as sole applicants, but you can see there aren't a whole lot of them. So, but in general, um, where we're working in rural communities, um, we're helping uh, municipalities form a coalition uh, of local interests, um, you know, to help support each other and, and tackle, tackle regional brownfield issues. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that coalitions um, don't make sense in more metro areas, uh, in places like Henderson, 
uh, in Clark County, Nevada, as well as Portland. Uh, we are working with coalitions um, and they do offer certain advantages. Um, as I go through my slides today, we're gonna share with you uh, the logistics and uh, benefits, challenges, and, and best practices we've learned uh, in working in these rural areas and with in coalitions in general. Um, but you know, two examples that I'll, I'll draw upon as I go through uh, my presentation are uh, the Kodiak Island Borough Coalition. And if you look at the lower left-hand side of the map, um, there's the state of Alaska there. Uh, Kodiak Island is a, a rural area um, about 400 uh, miles uh, southwest of the, the municipality of Anchorage. And in 2017, um, the borough, which is the equivalent of a county in Alaska, uh, partnered with the, uh, the only municipality that the city of Kodiak uh, and an Alaska Native Corporation, the Natives of Kodiak, um, to successfully pursue a uh, $600,000 coalition assessment grant. And then um, another example is all the way across the map, uh, up in the Northeast, um, we, uh, assisted the uh, Northeast Vermont Development Authority uh, in 2018 uh, in securing a $600,000 coalition uh, grant. And that, that uh, uh, grant is focused on a tri-county area in Northeast Vermont um, that actually has about 65,000 people in it, but it's spread out over a very large area. Um, and, and the Northeast Vermont Development Authority um, works as both the Regional Planning Commission uh, as well as the uh, Regional Economic Development Group. Um, and so they actually represent about 55 uh, small rural communities uh, throughout the Tri-County area and were the perfect uh, kind of figurehead for uh, a coalition in that area. Next slide. So what is a coalition? Um, a coalition is very simply a, a group of three or more um, eligible entities um, that works together to both submit one grant application um, for an assessment grant, um, and then they uh, agree to, to, to partner together um, throughout the implement, uh, implementation period uh, to successfully implement the grant. Um, in general, um, the coalition lead, you have to identify one, they're the main applicant. Um, we, we simply state here that it's uh, the entity with the greatest commitment to the project, uh, but commitment can take um, various, uh, shapes and forms. Um, it can be the uh, entity that has the uh, most organizational infrastructure or capacity to actually manage the grant. Um, you know, it can also be uh, an entity in the region um, that takes the most active role in economic development or revitalization. Um, and then oftentimes as well, um, a, a good coalition lead will also represent the broader jurisdiction. So um, in, in the case of um, the examples I gave, the, the borough or a, a regional development group. Um, excuse me. So why form a coalition? Um, many uh, small communities, you know, face organizational infrastructure um, issues. Um, they, they don't have the capacity um, and, and they sometimes are hard to compete against, you know, uh, compelling uh, grant applicants like the city of Milwaukee. And so uh, working, working together, um, they can help overcome these challenges um, and also help small communities that um, otherwise wouldn't be able to go after grants on their own. Uh, next slide. There are uh, benefits uh, to coalitions as well as challenges. Uh, one of the benefits is that you can actually apply for a $600,000 uh, coalition assessment grant um, as a coalition, um, whereas as a solo applicant right now for a, an assessment grant over the last two competitions, uh, you've been limited to $300,000. So there are um, financial incentives uh, uh, for forming coalitions. Um, excuse me. Um, there's, it's also a, um, a mechanism to help small communities, as I mentioned before, um, that would otherwise have difficulty um, in both pursuing the grants and implementing them. Um, you know, it, it, it provides that extra structure um, to successfully implement a grant. Um, and as well, it allows uh, communities to, you know, share um, redevelopment um, plans and, and visions um, and opportunities and, and best practices uh, and, and really work together. Um, and as well, the grants can actually be used um, to, you know, complete a whole host of inventory um, and outreach and, um, you know, other planning activities that uh, can serve as long-term tools 
you know, to, you know, collectively help uh, the greater area. Uh, next slide. Challenges, um, grant applications for coalitions um, historically have been uh, much more challenging. Um, you know, you have to describe, you know, the, the opportunities, uh, the needs, um, you know, in, in each of the jurisdictions, uh, but you're still limited to a 15 page limit um, as well. It, it actually makes the, um, you know, the, the unified story um, a little bit more difficult to tell because in effect you're telling, you know, three different stories uh, interwoven. Um, you know, th there are um, additional documentation required, um, letters of commitment um, and, and other things as well. Um, so, um, you know, it, you know, the, the extra money uh, you get uh, from applying for a, a coalition assessment grant uh, is, is hard earned, but, um, you know, our, our success in recent times and in, in looking at the statistics with EPA, um, if the coalition makes sense um, and, and you can form it, um, you know, with the supporting partners, uh, um, you know, it, it, our, our, our studies show that they have uh, just as uh, equal opportunity to be funded. Um, there are additional, um, you know, challenges once the funding is awarded. Um, prior to uh, drawing down any funding uh, for a coalition assessment grant, uh, the, uh, um, you know, the coalition partners need to enter into uh, a memorandum of agreement and understanding um, that typically has to be done after the a cooperative agreement work plan and cooperative agreements established um, as that document references, um, you know, the, the base contract uh, between the municipality and EPA. So uh, in, in general, you, um, you know, can't get uh, started early, um, but if you, um, you know, do tackle the memorandum of agreement um, as, as part of the process of establishing the, the cooperative agreement, um, you, you can put yourself in a position um, to get started early in the fall. Um, and uh, next slide. Uh, our, we found that the best practices uh, for forming coalitions are, um, you know, usually a, a county uh, or a regional, um, you know, agency, um, you know, with the most expansive geographic area, as I mentioned, um, one that has the most organizational infrastructure internally, um, to help do the grant management reporting and interface with all the stakeholders, um, you know, and one that also as well, um, you know, takes an active role in uh, redevelopment in that community, um, you know, really is important to have the right lead agency, um, you know, executing the memorandum of agreement, uh, as I mentioned previously, um, you know, is a, a great strategy to keep your project on, on track after funding is awarded. Um, and then um, you really have to, go out of your way to, to demonstrate that, um, you know, these municipalities have worked together successfully in the past, um, define roles, um, and, and really, um, you know, there's extra criteria for um, how sites are gonna be prioritized uh, in each community, um, you know, to uh, make, make sure that um, there's some consistency uh, throughout the implementation period. Uh, we've also found that um, for, forming, you know, stakeholder groups or um, advisory committees um, in each of the coalition partner uh, jurisdictions is, is an also a helpful way uh, as well as having, you know, that, that structure um, regionally as, as part of the broader grant. Um, and with that, I'll go to the next slide. So, um, you know, uh, small towns and rural areas, um, we've worked with several that, that have not formed uh, coalitions and have been successful uh, in and of themselves. Um, but but they do they do face challenges uh, often with uh, successfully implementing the grants uh, when awarded. Um, EPA uh, historically um, has defined uh, you know what a rural uh, areas or small town in several different ways. Uh, a new def definition popped out uh, as part of the uh, fiscal year 2018 guidelines, where Region 8 actually had a priority um, to uh, award funding to population centers that. Uh, cumulatively had less than uh, 50,000 uh, people. Um, you know, over the past few competitions, uh, EPA has also provided uh, special con considerations in general uh, for any uh, applicant that has less than 10,000 uh, people. And, and the, the spirit behind that was that, um, you know, they, uh, you know, over time, a lot of metro areas had, had gotten the bulk of the funding 
and uh, they wanted to kind of distribute funding, uh, you know, and, and help uh, more rural areas um, be able to develop programs. Uh, and then this past year in 2018, um, it was actually a regional priority in half the regions um, to, um, you know, give special consideration uh, to communities that uh, are working together uh, to support uh, municipalities with uh, limited in-house capacity. Uh, next slide. Um, some of these special considerations actually help level the playing field, um, you know, uh, with, with the more metro areas that, that have other advantages. Um, another uh, thing that EPA has done to uh, assist small towns and rural communities uh, or first-time applicants in general is the uh, applications have been being scored, you know, separately, um, you know, if you're a first-time applicant versus, you know, the Milwaukee's uh, of the world that, um, you know, are, are past grantees and have a lot of experience. So um, there's there's an added, uh, you know, opportunity and, and success um, percentage, you know, from being a first-time applicant. Um, and, and we've also found that um, stakeholder involvement, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in small communities, uh, stakeholders take a, a more ownership into the projects and the success of it. And so we found that uh, um, finding good local champions in these communities can really, um, you know, be a differentiator. Um, and also, you know, in small communities, um, you know, there's the same amount of funding available, uh, you know, uh, $300,000, 600000 grants, but in a small community, uh, that, that, that amount of funding can actually make a huge difference in, and have a, a really big revitalization uh, impact overall. Next slide. Um, challenge, uh, yes, there's, there's gonna be a competition with um, metro areas in general uh, in telling that kind of compelling story. Um, you know, but every community we found ha has a story to tell. Um, there obviously is gonna be limited organizational capacity to secure and implement competitive grants. Um, and then there's also, you know, challenges with redevelopment opportunities because um, the cost to clean up a brownfield uh, oftentimes will be uh, the same amount to assess and, and clean up a site, um, but the, the property values and redevelopment opportunities um, are, are generally proportionately less. So, um, you know, overall that, that that's a challenge with brownfield redevelopment in small communities. And then, um, you know, in, in some of these rural areas, you know, there, there's just a, um, you know, idea of, you know, why don't we just uh, redevelop, you know, the, the next farmer's field down the, roll, uh, down the road um, instead of, you know, facilitating infill development. And so um, that, that's an added challenge in rural areas where there are available uh, greenfield lands that haven't been redeveloped. Uh, next slide. Uh, best practice, um, you know, uh, for, form coalitions uh, in rural areas, um, you know, look, look to see, um, you know, which, which entity in that uh, area ha has the most capacity. Um, you know, you really have to uh, demonstrate that uh, you're going to have strong organizational, um, you know, capability, uh, programmatic capability to implement the grants. Um, you know, looking at uh, past successes with other grants um, that, that the communities had um, is, is one of the key factors uh, in demonstrating that. Um, uh, prioritize uh, sites that will have a greater impact. Um, you know, definitely, um, you know, tell the story that hey, this, this uh, corner gas station property in this small town, um, you know, in another community might not make that big of a difference, but, you know, in our community, that's the first thing people see when they come to town and cleaning it up and revitalizing it um, and putting it back into productive use uh, will we'll change, you know, the perception of our community. Um, and it has a great, you know, chance to, to facilitate um, other, other redevelopment uh, throughout, throughout the, the area. Um, work with uh, an experienced consultant. Um, you know, we, there's several, you know, consultants out there uh, in each area that um, have experience with brownfield issues uh, in writing EPA grants, and that can be an asset. Uh, of course, partner with the Center for Creative Land Recycling uh, and use the, the wide array of EPA resources that CCLAIR has on their website uh, to support communities who are applying. And then um, there are networks within each region, um, you know, of uh, you know, ongoing, uh, you know, municipalities that have grants, um, you know, and, and have um, a lot of experience. And so get, get involved in, 
and network with those communities and learn from their experience. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, one for uh, Chris, uh, stay on the line, and we'll have one for Eileen and for Matt as well. For Chris, uh, the coalitions, when you, uh, how are they formed, or how far ahead of the grants are they formed? And do you have the agreements worked out before you submit the application? So the uh, coalitions are generally formed, you know, in the year leading up to an application, and uh, obviously the assessment. Uh, the ARC grant competition is every fall, um, and uh, there does not need to be a memorandum of agreement in place when you apply for the funding. Uh, you do need, uh, you know, uh, letters of commitment uh, from the coalition members, and there's, um, you know, a few details that need to go into those. But um, memorandums of agreement, um, although um, they they can be a strong thing to have in place at the time you apply, they really don't need to be. Um, put in place until um, you know you've worked through, you've been awarded the funding, and you've worked through the cooperative agreement work plan stage, um, and prior to spending down funding. So, um, all yes. right, thank you, thank you, Chris. How about for Matt? The question for Matt is: uh, adaptive reuse. Was there were there any opportunities for adaptive reuse, and if they were, uh, what did uh, how were they done? Um. Adaptive reuse. Uh, you know, in thinking about, uh, you know, at least the one example that I gave uh, during the presentation with the Menominee Valley, you know, as far as uh, reusing any of the uh, infrastructure down there or any of the uh, uh, buildings that were down there, that was unable to be done uh, due to the dilapidated nature down there. So, um, you know, at least not in that particular case. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, uh, at least for that example, um, of any cases where right. we were able to do that, at least with that example. Right, thank you. And for Eileen, uh, what is the role of the uh, EPA grants for the uh, present dunes project? Under, okay, this is where um, you can really fully utilize the grant by participating in the national and regional workshops in this case, um, we actually, the grant that, that was identified to support mine uh, redevelopment was uh, targeted at a different site. It was a former Barrick uh, Bullfrog mine site. And um, what they did was they allowed us to reach out to a lot of the solar community members and say, look, we have these opportunities available. And DOE did a, uh, or pr participated in developing a study of solar incident potential. So we we actually took a lot of the information from the workshop that was intended for Barrick to the Boston uh, National Works or National Conference for Brownfields and presented a poster presentation. And during that presentation, we had a number of developers come up and ask questions. And within six months of that presentation, that was done back in 2006, we had um, over 100 sections of land, 111 sections of land, and each section is what 640 acres applied for by solar energy companies. And the idea was we, we tried to encourage the developers, you know, because many of them applied for BLM land. And we said, we, if, if possible, the community would like to work with you, but it's a lot cheaper to use existing infrastructure. So the Anaconda mine had been closed down for a while and um, in kind of helping her or, or direct some of these developers, we um, identified several sites where there was existing infrastructure and um, and that was one of them. Solar Crescent Dunes was looking for a location, um, or not Crescent Dunes, the Solar Reserve was looking for a location to site one of their facilities, and that's how we did it, was working with them to identify previously utilized infrastructure. So that's, that was the role that Brownfields played, and basically it attracted an entire industry. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we have no more questions, so I'd like to thank all our speakers, did a great job. Thank you for listening in. And we have another webinar in two weeks about rocket science remediation. So please uh, log into that because that will be very interesting. Thank you again to all our speakers. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. And see you next time.